So, good evening, everybody. If I could have your attention, thank you. So, my name is Anne Dow. I am head of the Department of Life Sciences, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here. The, this is Professor Bernadette Burns' inaugural lecture, and we're all looking forward to hearing her. Um, we're joined today by staff and students from Imperial, by visitors, by friends and family, and I'd particularly like to draw attention and thank for coming the support group in the front row. So Bernadette's husband, Simon, her children, Emily and Reuben, and her sister, Angela, and Angela's husband, David. So welcome, and I'm sure you're going to be rooting for Bernadette. And also, I'm sure there are plenty of Bernadette's uh, present and past members of her research group also in the audience, and again, they will be cheering her along. So firstly, a little tiny bit of housekeeping. We are not planning, or the building is not planning, on having a fire alarm test this evening. So if the fire alarm goes off, it is for real. You need to leave by the nearest exit. So there's exits at the back and here at the front. And the assembly point is Prince Consort Road, i.e. outside the building. So if you do have a fire alarm, please uh, finish up on Prince Consort Road. So, as I was saying to Bernadette earlier, I really enjoy this kind of lecture because it is an opportunity for someone to be talking in a relatively informal way about not just all of the amazing stuff that they've done, which has led up to them being promoted to professor at Imperial College, but also at the same time to recognize their friends and family who have helped them along the way. And the audience, I know, always enjoy this mix of the personal and the professional in an inaugural lecture. So I hope Bernadette, in fact she is, because she said she would be, showing a little bit about her family and her, the way that she has got to the position she is at. So all I'm going to do is just briefly introduce some of the facts that have led Bernadette to where she is now. Uh, for those who haven't read the handout that you were sent with a little bit of expansion. So Bernadette obtained her BSc in Zoology at the University of Liverpool in 1992, and then moved across the border into Scotland to Aberdeen for her PhD, um, which was in reproductive endocrinology. And then after her PhD, she didn't come back across the border, but she moved closer to the border to the University of Edinburgh to the Medical Research Council's Reproductive Biology Unit. And there she got her passion for membrane proteins. So I'm not going to tell you, obviously, some of you know all about membrane proteins. For those who don't know much about it, I'm sure Bernadette will explain with some beautiful images later. But basically, fundamentally, these are proteins that live their lives in the membranes which surround cells. And they function like a gateway into the cell. So they regulate things going from outside to inside or messages going from outside to inside. And when Bernadette first started working on these kind of proteins, she was looking at a really interesting receptor that's very, very important to women in the pituitary gland, which, and men, uh, which is associated with reproduction, which obviously links into her background for her PhD. But she started to work on the purification of this protein, um, and ultimately from that, her career started to where she is today. So she had became passionately interested in how to understand the structure and function of these very, very difficult to analyze membrane proteins. At that time, they were incredibly difficult to analyze, and it's thanks to Bernadette's work that it is so much easier now to do the kinds of analyses that are uh, now, I wouldn't say routine. I know there are some senior people in the audience who would not regard them as routine. So Bernadette's career essentially started in uh, Edinburgh with respect to this protein receptor. She very sensibly moved to the country, which at that time was doing some of the forefront work in this area, which was Sweden, and took a postdoctoral appointment with Professor Sori Wata at the University of Uppsala, I believe, but also linking in immediately with what is another strand of Bernadette's career, which is interactions with industries. So her postdoc was jointly with a big multinational pharmaceutical company of that time called Pharmacia Upjohn. 
So a couple of years there, and then Imperial College made the very sensible decision with Jim Barber's support, and Jim is sitting here in the audience, of recruiting uh, Professor Sariwata to Imperial to establish a membrane protein crystallography laboratory. And Bernadette came with him and within a year had been promoted to lecture or uh, had been appointed as a lecturer in the department and then has gone up the tree in the department, senior lecturer, reader, and obviously today we're celebrating her professorship. So she is going to tell you all about her science, and I'm sure she's going to explain it much more eloquently than I ever could, so I'm not going to say anything more about it. But I do want to, before I hand over to Bernadette, uh, just point out that Bernadette is an exemplar of an outstanding academic. So she is a wonderful academic in all aspects of her life, not just her research. She's a superb teacher. She has uh, won the faculties. Uh, Teaching Excellence Award. She was also nominated by the students for a award which is much more important than being nominated by the faculty. And she has also served the community. She served the college with being the uh, deputy director for the graduate school for about five years and was responsible for bringing in much of the training that we now take for granted for all our postgraduate students. Externally, she served on a whole variety of committees, but Importantly, she spent a number of years helping others to get grants by serving on one of the four uh, committees of the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council. She's also served on the uh, University of Edinburgh's steering committee. So Bernadette, your outstanding achievements were deservedly recognized in 2017 by, for, by being promoted to Professor of Molecular Membrane Biology. And I'd like you to invite you now to deliver your lecture entitled Nanoscale Transport, Getting Across the Membranes of Our Cells. Thank you. And this is summarized in this very simplified diagram I show you here. And this is a uh, diagram that I took inspiration for from a GCSE biology textbook. So this is the image that you're presented with when you first start to work in the area of biology. And this has some very key components that are common to all different cell types. So first of all, here in the center, we see the nucleus. Okay, this is, of course, is the region of the cell that houses the DNA, and this is the molecule that makes you, you. Also within cells, we find mitochondria. These are the little power stations of the cell that produce ATP. And then surrounding the nucleus and the mitochondria is the cytoplasm. And this is a complex mixture of material where a whole range of uh, important chemical reactions take place. And then surrounding the whole of this is something called the cell membrane. Now, in simplified cell diagrams, you'll see this typically represented as a simple black line. Now, what this, molecule, what this region of the uh, cell does is, as Anne has already indicated, it acts as a sort of gateway into and out of the cell. It controls what goes into and out of that cell. But it also acts as a barrier. It creates 
uh, uh, each cell as an individual uh, uh, environment separates each cell from the external and other uh, cells as well. But this individual black line, of course, is much, much more complicated than is shown here. And this is a, a more accurate representation of what a cell membrane looks like. So the cell membrane is a complex mixture of lipid molecules. And these lipid molecules associate with one another to form a highly hydrophobic core. And it's this hydrophobic core that limits what goes into and out of the cell. And studied through this hydrophobic core are specialized membrane proteins. I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to stop and switch to another... Uh, laser pointer, because that one's not showing up at all. Luckily, I always come prepared, <laughs> and I have a spare one here, which is much better than that one, but I'll just have to switch over the, the connector here as well, so sorry for that minor, a minor interruption there, and hopefully you can see this much, much clearer now. Okay, so... It's studded through with these integral membrane proteins. And these integral membrane proteins perform a wide range of uh, biological tasks. And I'm going to come back to this image later, but it's this uh, uh, structure, this part of the cell, that I've spent the vast majority of my research career focused on. But before I go into that in a little bit more detail, I want to tell you a little bit more about myself. So as many of you might have guessed, or you knew already, my roots are not here in the UK. So uh, often people know this just from my name. Okay? It's uh, clearly an Irish name. Uh, my family come originally from Dublin in Ireland. And my parents moved over to the UK in the 1960s. Uh, they would take like, a lot of Irish emigres, the ferry from Dublin to Liverpool, which was commonly referred to by all people who did this journey as the boat. And from there, they made the journey from Liverpool to a small town with the rather unlovely name of Rottenstall. But <laughs> Rottenstall itself actually is a rather lovely place. It's nestled on the eastern edge of the uh, Pennines, and it's surrounded by these beautiful rolling hills. But that wasn't what drew my parents to the area, beautiful as it is. What drew them to that area was the heavy industry there, because uh, there were huge numbers of jobs in what was then the centre of the cotton industry uh, in Lancashire. And uh, this isn't projecting particularly well, I have to say, but this image here shows uh, one of the major factories that were up and running at the time my parents moved over uh, in the mid-60s. And you can still see scars on the landscape with these smokestacks are still present in the environment today, although the factories themselves and the whole industry is long gone. Here I have some photographs of me as a small child. Here I am with my dad and my older sister sitting on my dad's knee there. And here is a photograph of me in the orange and the yellow dress uh, next to my older sister again and my younger sister sitting on her knee. And this, you can't see this very well in this picture, but my sister here is wearing a very characteristic dress. She's dressed all in white. She's seven at this point. And this photograph was taken to mark a very important event in a, a, a Catholic's life. She's just made her first Holy Communion. So I grew up in the 1970s, and one of the key things that I remember being particularly inspired by was the uh, space launches that took place during the 1970s. Now, these formed a really, really strong memory in my head, and I was surprised when I went back to research this lecture that there were remarkably few of these, so I must have been really, really excited about them at the time. Uh, this is an image of uh, a very important space launch, which was the Voyager, that took place in 1977, and I was very, very intrigued by this. I was also inspired by books and reading. Books have formed an incredibly important part of my life from the earliest age I can remember. And I was extremely lucky in having access to an excellent library. This is about five or ten minutes from my parents' house. And I spent many, many hours trawling uh, both the uh, lending section of this and the reference section. 
But we didn't just have access to uh, books there. We had a lot of books at home. And these were two books that I remember uh, in the house when I was growing up. I'd be intrigued if anybody else remembers these. These were a fantastic set of books. Do you remember these, Angela? The How and Why Wonder Book series. And these were the, really the first books that introduced me to science as a child. So having been thoroughly inspired uh, to go into science, I then, as Anne has already mentioned, went to the University of Liverpool. And there I undertook, although my honours degree was in zoology, the degree I started with was biological sciences, and then I did a specialisation in the final year. Um, and this degree I sort of think of as, as a period in my life of two halves. And the first half I refer to as the bad and the ugly. And the bad here refers to something called fieldwork. Now, fieldwork, of course, as many of you know, involves going out into the environment and performing experiments or collecting samples so you can take them back into the laboratory for further analysis. And I hated this. So I have a very, very strong memory of standing on a hillside in Gloucestershire in the absolute pouring rain, trying to catch grasshoppers. And I couldn't see the grasshoppers. And on the very rare occasion I did see them, I couldn't catch them. They just seemed to slip out of my hands. Another thing we had to do involved this piece of equipment here. This is something called a pooter. Now, so what you do as a field scientist, you go out into the field with a sheet and a pooter, and you put the sheet down next to a bush or a tree, and then you take a stick and you beat the bush or the, or the tree. And all the bugs that are living in that tree or that bush fall onto the white sheet. And then you use this pooter to collect them. You put your mouth on this piece here and you suck. And you use this piece of tubing here to hoover up the bugs that are on your sheet. And then you take the pooter back to the laboratory and then you, 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 you identify what bugs you've caught. And again, I hated this as well. <laughs> and uh, these are some examples of some bugs that uh, we, we, we caught in this way. Uh, they're always green in my memory. Uh, <laughs> Some of the bugs that had to, we had to suck uh, up into this little device were quite big. Some of them would fall into the, the tube here with an audible pop. And 10 minutes later, my toes would uncurl and I could get on with whatever it was I was doing. <laughs> so this was the stuff that I didn't really like. I mean, field work is really important. You know, I'm not denigrating this area of science at all. It just wasn't for me. Uh, but the good aspects uh, of my time at Liverpool are based on uh, the uh, work that was done by this guy here. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, a photograph of him. He's one of my lecturers uh, when I was at uh, Liverpool, Dave Ensor, he was called. And Dave worked in an area called comparative endocrinology. So for anybody who doesn't know, endocrinology is the study of hormones or chemical signals. These chemical signals are constantly circulating in your body, allowing different parts of your body to talk to one another. So your brain produces hormones that control things like your metabolic rate. And this particular book that Dave wrote uh, in the 1970s uh, focuses on comparative endocrinology of prolactin. So this is a hormone most of you will have heard of. It's the molecule that's responsible for the milk letdown response in lactating females. And the comparative aspect here relates to the fact that that's what it does in humans and other mammals. But in insects, it does something completely different. And it does something completely different again in things like uh, amphibians and reptiles. So this, these hormones, these chemical signals that are circulating in the body are incredibly powerful molecules. And this is a study that was published about 10 years ago, but it mirrors some of the work that was going on in Dave's lab at the time I was in Liverpool. So here we have a, a schematic of uh, the limb of a newt, uh, an amphibian. If you cut off the end of that limb, and you then apply a hormone called thyroxine, you can regrow that limb. And this, for me, was incredibly exciting. These molecules circulating in the system, having these extraordinary effects, uh, was something that I was very, very, inter very interested in and wanted to pursue further. And this, in turn, led me to the University of Aberdeen. And I worked with uh, Professor Paul Fowler, uh, who at that point, was focused on this particular part of the endocrine system. 
which controls female reproductive function. Now, this is a very complicated system involving lots of different molecules. So there's a, and there's a hierarchy in this, that some molecules are at the top, and then you sort of flow down into uh, further parts of the system. So at the top, we have this molecule here called gonadotrophin-releasing hormone. And this is produced by an area of the brain. This interacts or has an effect on another part of the brain called the pituitary gland. And this, in turn, causes the production of two other hormones, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And these two together work to drive the production of follicles and ultimately ovulation, which is a critical event in uh, female reproduction. So at the time I worked on this uh, uh, system, this was pretty well characterized. But what was far less uh, known was that there were other hormones that were produced by the ovary that fed back into this system. And it really wasn't clear what these, these molecules were doing. So in order to study this system, we had to have uh, a, a, a system of cells that allows us to analyze what was happening when we added specific hormones to them. And this involved going to uh, the abattoir, so the slaughterhouse, to get sheep heads. And we'd crack open the sheep heads and, and remove uh, the pituitary glands, and then we'd take them back to the laboratory and prepare uh, tissue culture from them. And I hated doing this. Okay, so this didn't get off to a great start. So uh, first of all, I had to get dressed up like this, which I really didn't enjoy. I had to wear these blue overalls, a hairnet, and a hard hat, and some green wellies. And this is in Aberdeen, and it rained all the time. Uh, and I had to get dressed in the car park, which was just awful. In fact, one time we were driving to, to, the, to the abattoir. It was pouring with rain. And as we turned a corner... Uh, a gust of wind came in off the North Sea and ripped one of the uh, uh, windscreen wipers from its housing. So Paul had to get out of the car, go around and fix it in the pouring rain. I mean, in retrospect, maybe I should have got out and helped, but it was raining. <laughs> so, so I was really lucky that this animal model didn't work. So we had to switch to something else, and I never had to go again. So about six months in, we realized that this was a no-go, and we moved on to a different system. So, ultimately, what we found during, this, uh, during my PhD was that there were specific molecules produced by the ovary that had very, very uh, individual effects at the level of the pituitary. Okay, so one molecule produced here would affect luteinizing hormone, but have no effect whatsoever on the follicle-stimulating hormone. And these, there was lots of crosstalk. These individual molecules were talking to each other and having uh, synergistic effects. But as far as I was concerned at this point, what we were focusing on was the fact that we had a hormone, its chemical signal, and then we saw an output. And what was happening in between, at least as far as I was concerned, was an enormous black box. Okay? And clearly, there was a lot going on there between the hormone and the output. And this is where we now come back to the biological membrane. Because the information that's stored in these chemical signals, these hormones, has to get across from one side of the membrane to the other. And it's here that it's going to have its effect. So I bring you now back to this diagram here. So I mentioned already that we have this very hydrophobic core in the membrane. And it's this that limits what can get into and out of the cell. And so the cell has had to evolve special mechanisms to allow it to both transport nutrients like sugars and amino acids into the cell, but also to transfer information as is stored in these hormones or chemical signals. Equally, the cell has to have a mechanism by which it can export toxins and waste products. And this membrane is also not just used as a transfer mechanism, okay? It's also absolutely fundamental in a process that's absolutely critical for cell function, and that's energy generation, and I will touch on that briefly. So as Anna's already mentioned, this led me to a three-year postdoc in Edinburgh, 
uh, working at the MRC Centre for Reproductive Biology, as it was then, it's now the MRC Centre for Reproductive Health. Uh, and this is really where I cut my teeth on working with membrane proteins. I worked with one of these receptors that are central to the control of uh, female reproductive function. Uh, and, and it's here I really learned my first initial skills uh, associated with membrane proteins. And this in turn led on to this uh, postdoc position in Sweden that was split between Uppsala and Pharmacia and Upjohn. Though I have to say I spent most of my time at Pharmacia because that's, they had the kit. Uh, Uppsala really wasn't set up for large-scale production of membrane proteins at that time. And it was here that I worked with, with So, uh, somebody who many of you will be very uh, familiar with. And this is a very a lovely picture, actually, of So that was taken for his inaugural lecture back in 2006, which I think is lovely. But he didn't look like this when I first met him. He turned up at Arlanda Airport. He came to pick me up for the interview. He looked awful. And part of the reason he looked awful is because he'd been up all night refining this beautiful structure here. This is an integral membrane protein uh, that is <clears throat> key in energy generation. It's called the cytochrome BC1 complex. And as Anne has indicated, so was one of the very few people at this time who was brave enough or stupid enough to, to work on uh, membrane proteins. But he had a huge impact in the field even 20 years ago. So. Now I want to talk a little bit about working with membrane proteins and some of the issues that we face on a daily basis working with these types of molecules. This is a picture of my daughter, Emily, doing the washing up. Uh, thank you, Emily. So, <laughs> she doesn't do this very often, I have to say. Um, so what I want to sort of use this to illustrate is that working with membrane proteins is rather like doing the washing up. So some of the issues that we face are similar. So here, down at the bottom uh, of the slide, I've shown you an image of a dirty frying pan. This is greasy <coughs> frying pan. And this is greasy and dirty because it's got uh, fatty deposits in it. These fatty deposits are made up of uh, fat molecules that are associated together. Okay? And in order to get rid of these fatty deposits, we have to use washing up liquid. Okay? And what this washing up liquid does is it forms microscopic soap bubbles. And these microscopic soap bubbles destroy the forces that hold these fatty deposits together. And it essentially, these soap bubbles surround the uh, fat molecules, and this makes them soluble in water-based solution. And we can then take these soap and fat molecule uh, complexes and wash them down the sink, okay? So when we're working with membrane proteins in the lab, we actually do more or less the same thing. So here we use a different form of detergent, okay? It's much gentler than the one that you find in your washing up liquid, and it's a hell of a lot more expensive, as my guys will testify. So here we have our detergent solution, and we add this to our membrane sample. And what happens is these individual detergent bubbles, these soap bubbles, they disrupt the forces that hold the membrane together. And they also effectively coat the regions of the proteins or the lipid molecules that are hydrophobic. And this allows us to work with these molecules in a water-based solution. We can then, here we've got a complex mixture of materials. We've got the individual protein molecules as well as the lipid uh, molecules. Using specialized techniques, we can separate out the individual molecule that we're interested in. Oops. And then we can take these and we can attempt to obtain crystals of those proteins. So, there are issues, though, when you're working with a molecule that's surrounded by a soap bubble. So when we're trying to obtain crystals of any protein, what we're looking for is for those individual molecules to interact with one another and form what we call a crystal lattice. And with membrane proteins, the molecules are limited in the way in which they can do this because of the presence of these large soap bubbles. But of course, you can get crystals of integral membrane proteins. So, and a few other people had shown that this was possible. 
And here I give you a snapshot image of a, a, a membrane, an integral membrane protein crystal lattice. And you'll see that there are lots of protein molecules here, and these are interacting with one another. But there's also very large swathes of what appears to be empty space. Now, it's not empty space. It's filled with solvent, and it's filled with detergent. But one thing that So and I worked on while I was in Sweden was, well, could we put something else in these open spaces within the crystal lattice and successfully crystallize them? And in actual fact, again, this isn't projecting very well, but you can do this. But we were only able to do it with something small and very uninteresting. As soon as we put something large and interesting in there, very strange things happen to the cell. But what we did manage to do as part of this work was crystallize this protein here called formate dehydrogenase. Okay? And this was a very important structure for us. Because as Anne has indicated there, so we moved from Sweden to, uh, to London. For almost the whole time I was in Sweden, so was in uh, negotiations with the then head of department of biochemistry, Jim Barber, to, to uh, move the whole lab from Uppsala uh, to London. And the first crystals we obtained of formate dehydrogenase, we did obtain in Sweden. And then we brought the project over to Imperial once we'd uh, uh, set up the lab here. And uh, we obtained uh, better quick crystals. And we uh, solved the structure uh, while we were here. And this was the first key structure of the group once we'd arrived at Imperial. And so it was a, an important uh, structure for, for us. So what does this molecule do? So formate dehydrogenase N works in concert with another molecule another integral membrane protein uh, called nitrate reductase. And these two molecules work together via a series, a complex series of chemical reactions to move protons from one side of the membrane to the other. And this has the effect of creating a much higher concentration of protons on one side of the membrane than the other. And it's the subsequent movement of these protons from one side back into the cell that drives the production of ATP, the energy source of the cell. But that's not all these protons do. So this proton, uh, high proton concentration on one side of the membrane is also used for, an, uh, for another key cellular process. So I mentioned already that we have special molecules uh, that are housed within the membrane that are responsible for moving molecules across the membrane. So uh, uh, sugars, amino acids, and other, and other important metabolites. And for some of these proteins, they're collectively called transporters, these, uh, the movement of the key molecule is coupled to the movement of a proton. So these two move together, and it's the energy that's stored in this high concentration of protons here that drives the movement of the, the substrate molecule. And so about 10 years ago or so, I uh, started a collaboration working on a special group of transporters that are responsible for movement of a key metabolite, uh, the nuclear bases. Okay, these are important for a range of different cellular processes. And I became uh, introduced to these by uh, Professor Claudio Scazzoccio, who was then a visiting professor here in uh, the CMBI, working in a Herb Ars group. And he'd spent a substantial amount of his career focused on this molecule here, UAPA, from a fungus called Aspergillus nidulans. And Claudio, in turn, introduced me to uh, his former PhD student, uh, George Dialinas from the University of Athens. And this uh, started what is uh, now a 10-year collaboration with, with uh, George. So these nuclear-based transporters, this UAPA in particular, is responsible for movement of xanthine and uric acid. And this movement is coupled to proton movement across the membrane. And UAPA from uh, the fungus Aspergillus nidulans is important because we need to understand how 
uh, all organisms are able to uptake this type of molecule. But it's also important because it's related to the human vitamin C transporter and a transporter from pathogenic fungi. So I just want to tell you a little bit now about the difficulty that we had working with this particular molecule. So normally when we start working with any protein in the lab, we start with what we call the native protein. This is the protein that exists in nature. Okay? Now when we uh, isolated this molecule, we did our detergent extraction process and our uh, isolation, what we found was the molecule underwent either severe degradation, so fell into tiny little pieces, or it unfolded and aggregated. So this protein was really, really unstable. So what we did was we turned to a process called mutation. Now, often we think of mutants as being something that are bad, and, and often they are bad. There are a lot of mutants that are certain mutations that are associated with disease states. But in the laboratory, we can use mutations to change the property of a protein to make it more suitable for our particular purposes. And in this particular protein, in UAPA, there is a particular site in the protein that's a glycine residue. We substituted that with a valine residue. Okay? Now, you don't need to know what that means, other than the fact that this molecule is bigger than this one. And this had the effect of stabilizing the protein sufficiently that we could isolate fully folded and a stable protein for further analysis. And it was this that we ultimately obtained the structure for. And here, I just give you a schematic of what this protein looks like. So it's organized into two domains. And for the purposes of this lecture, you only need to think about this as the blue domain and the red domain. Okay? Each of these individual blue cylinders, or red cylinders here, refers to a transmembrane part of the protein. And this is a region of the molecule that passes from one side of the membrane to the other. And this is what the protein looks like when it's all folded up in its full conformation. So here you can see the blue domain, and here you can see the red domain. Okay? It's very clear in the overall final fold of the protein. And what you're seeing here is a single unit of the transporter. But in its physiological state, and in the crystal structure as well, this is, a two, is made up of two molecules. And this is something we refer to as a dimer. And the molecule has to be in this dimeric state in order to perform its specific function. And I just want to sort of draw your attention to the fact that all of the interactions that mediate this, the formation of the dimer, are mediated by this blue domain. Now, if I rotate the molecule towards you, you can also see, hopefully here and here, that we have the substrate bound into the protein as well. So this is the molecule that's being transported across the membrane by UAPA. And I just draw your attention to the fact that all that this, the binding of the, uh, the substrate is mediated by the red domain. Okay? And this is important. I'll come back to that in a moment. So here I just show you this in a little video. The protein is now rotating, and you can see that the interactions are all mediated by this blue domain. And you can also see that the substrate is bound just by the red domain. So how does this protein work? Well, it wor works rather like an elevator. And in fact, the mechanism is called the elevator mechanism. So here I'm showing you just some regions of the protein. And the regions in gray here are those that are responsible for binding the substrate. So in a specific conformation, the protein is open on one side of the membrane, and the substrate can bind in to the substrate binding site. This region of the molecule then slides against the other region of the protein, and this pulls 
the substrate through the membrane. Okay, and you can see that here. The substrate is pulled through the membrane. And once it's been pulled through the membrane, the individual substrate molecules can be released on the opposite side of the membrane. Now here, I'm going to sh show you how the molecule moves in order to perform that specific function. I'm going to show you this uh, molecular dynamics simulation, which is a simulation of how the protein moves twice. The first time, I want you to look at this molecule here. This is the substrate, OK? So you'll see that the substrate sort of bobbles around on the extracellular face of the, uh, of the protein. And it then finds its substrate binding site, and it's then released on the opposite side of the membrane. Sorry. Now, I want you to watch this uh, simulation again, but now I want you to focus on the red region of the protein. Okay, so here we have the substrate. It's going to go into the uh, substrate binding site, and it slides through the membrane pulling the substrate with it, okay? So acting like a elevator. So I hope what I've done in the lecture today is give you an insight into how important proteins that exist within the membrane environment are. They play enormous number of key roles in cellular processes. From transferring information into cells so they can react and respond to changes in the external environment. They transfer molecules into the cell that are required for key cellular processes. And they're also fundamentally important for energy generation. But membrane proteins are also important for other things as well, including disease. A huge number of membrane proteins are associated with disease states. And membrane proteins, because of that, are also incredibly important therapeutic targets. So it's extremely important that we study these proteins so that we understand how they work at a molecular level so that ultimately we can understand better their roles in specific disease and we can also design new therapeutic agents to treat those diseases. So finally, of course, we come to what is probably the most important part of the talk, and that is a huge thank you to all the people who've been in my group over the years. And this goes all the way back to Mika, who was my first master's student when I was still a postdoc in Sweden, all the way down to Nicole and James, the two new PhD recruits in the lab. Uh, I really wouldn't be here without all the work that these guys put in. And I'm incredibly grateful to each and every one of them. I also thank all of the other people that I have collaborated with over the years. And here I've listed every single person that I have published a paper with. I stole that idea. I think he knows by from who. But I also want to thank uh, three specific collaborators. I've already mentioned George Dialinas, a, a key collaborator of mine over an extended period of time. But I want to specifically thank uh, Alex Cameron from the University of Warwick, Pilsok Che from Hangyang University in uh, South Korea, and Sergei Kazarian from the Department of Chemical Engineer here, Engineering here at Imperial. So these have been long-term collaborators, and I'm very grateful for them, uh, for their continued uh, work with me and my lab. I'd also like to thank uh, all the funding agencies We've had support in my group from a range of different sources over the years. This includes industry as well as uh, the standard funding agencies and so on. And I'd like to thank uh, those as well. And then I also need to thank some very, very special people. Being a scientist is hard. And what makes it easier, at least, or has made my life easier, is having the support of a, a very special group of people. And I do want to thank uh, my lovely daughter, Emily. I love this photograph. This was taken at uh, the wedding of one of my former PhD students when Emily acted as a flower girl. Uh, my lovely son, Ruben, uh, who's shaking his head, embarrassed. Oh, my God. I can't believe she showed that. And of course, my husband, Simon, who it wouldn't, none of this would be possible without him. Uh, we share all the ups and downs, the trials of a, of a, a research career, 
and when papers get rejected and grants don't get funded, but also the, the up points as well, like getting promoted and getting a big structure and so on. So I thank them so much, and I also thank them for coming today as well. Uh, and finally, all it remains for me to say is to thank you so much for coming and for your, for your patience and, and, uh, uh, and your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette, for an absolutely outstanding lecture. You did absolutely everything that I love about inaugurals, the mix of the personal and the professional. Thank you very much. We aren't going to have questions because Bernadette will be available at the reception, which will be on the concourse outside, um, and we want to have plenty of drinking and fun time. But So I now want to hand over to Professor Adrian Goldman from the University of Leeds, who will give the vote of thanks. Well, I don't quite know what to say. I'm very, really thanked her for a fantastic lecture. Um, I thought it was a marvelous occasion. I thought Bernard expressed really well, I suppose for me, what I think is a key feature of being a scientist is this, this moment of discovering not, what you, not only what you do like doing, which is science, but the bits of science that you think, God, why did I ever think of going to science? Because I hate these so much. <laughs> and I think all scientists have that experience of saying, you know, Yes, I like this, and no, I don't like that. And it's really nice to see it brought out, because I, I know I've been through that, that moment, too. Um, I thought it was a wonderful talk, story of how, one, of how you grew up through your family and, and how they moved to England. I thought that was fantastic. And I can see absolutely that you'd be a fantastic lecturer. I'd like to sit in your lectures, because they're much better than mine, that I can say. <laughs> um, and I... It was, I thought, I think, a beautiful description of how you can connect the various parts of a scientific career together, from the first moments of looking at endocrinology, then to thinking, well, actually, you know, that's, that's nice, there are hormones, and that's really interesting, but really the important stuff is how you get from a signal to a response. I think it was a very... And then, then taking that, so I'm going to look at membrane proteins, and then walking through from membrane proteins to energy proteins, from energy to the effect of energy proteins, what they do, the generation of a proton motive force, the thing that actually makes life possible um, for us on this planet, and then into transporters, and finally pointing out that connects out to drugs, drugs and potentially to drug design, and the things that, that matter, I guess, to, to possibly the lay people in the audience more than structures, though, of course... I think the structures of biology in the audience, actually the structures are the best part by a, by a long shot. So with that, I'd like to thank Bernadette for a wonderful lecture and to give a vote of thanks for her, please. Thank you.